Hi, I'm Craig Smith, a former New York Times correspondent and host of the podcast Eye on AI. I'm also a special government employee with the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And in this role, I'm serving as the host for NSC AI's podcast series on the Commission's work. At the beginning of March this year, the Commission issued its final report to the President and Congress, outlining its recommended strategy for winning in the artificial intelligence era. This week, I spoke to NSC AI staff Mike Garris and Mike Jackson about what needs to be done to lay the foundations for an AI-infused national security going forward. I hope you find the conversation as informative as I did. If we can start by having you each introduce yourselves and introduce what we're going to talk about here, setting the technical foundation for AI in the national security establishment. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Michael Jackson. I'm the Army detailee uh, on the commission where I have been focused primarily on AI and its application for national security, looking both within the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. And Mike Garris? Yes, Craig. My name is Michael Garris. I am a computer scientist from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Can you describe the Commission's vision for expanding the digital ecosystem to support AI innovation? It's the Commission's assessment that the Department of Defense lags far behind the commercial sector in integrating new and disruptive technologies like AI into its operations. There's some good news here, though. Pockets of excellence started to emerge in 2017 with Project Maven. And Project Maven was launched with the aim to simplify work for intelligence analysts by using AI to recognize and track objects in video footage captured by drones and other overhead platforms. And since then, there's been quite a few other promising initiatives occurring. They're taking place in defense labs and in components. There's proof of concept demonstrations ongoing and service level tests. And yet, it's our assessment that visionary technologists and warfighters largely remain stymied by antiquated technology, cumbersome processes, and outdated incentive structures. And so this leads us to one of our recommendations which is that the Department of Defense needs to have AI integrated across its enterprise. That's from all the way out at the tactical edge, all the way back to the headquarters. We're talking about including service laboratories and researchers there, and then also back office automation for business processes. Now, this is a foundational element of our vision for the DOD being AI ready by 2025. And to get there, the DOD must invest in this department-wide digital ecosystem. And when we say that, we're talking about compute and data, train models, and environments for ubiquitous development, testing, and fielding of AI capabilities at all these different levels. And it's essential to establish this technical foundation in three ways. So first... It needs to provide access to leading cloud technologies and services for scalable computing. And then next, it needs to enable the sharing of data and software and capabilities through well-documented interfaces based on industry standard protocols, along with the proper access control, so everything's secured. And then the third thing here is this infrastructure in the DoD needs to give all of its developers and scientists access to the tools and resources they need to drive new AI capabilities. So the ecosystem, we envision it being realized by building on these bright spots, these pathfinder efforts across the department 
connecting existing resources and then layering on top of that governance with adherence to a community-driven open architecture that'll glue it all together. And this would create what we call a marketplace. So we're talking about promoting the exchange of essential AI building blocks through federated repositories of this data and software and algorithms, trained AI models, along with pre-negotiated computing and storage services from a pool of vetted cloud providers. And this should incorporate the joint AI center, the Jake. They've been doing really good work on something that they call the Joint Common Foundation. And this should be incorporated in the ecosystem because the JCF, as it's called, aims to provide a data catalog that can reach both hosted and remote data stores, shared among mission partners. It includes a tools repository, so software repository, to enable AI, machine learning, engineering, data conditioning, software deployment. It's the same as to support scaling among enterprise cloud and edge computing and storage and provide workflows to support rapid development that's secure and tested, evaluated, and, and delivery to be able to deliver these capabilities. So to achieve all that, the commission in the final report, I'd like to highlight three key areas of action so that we could see this ecosystem come together. And the first would be to establish the needed leadership and governance from the top. Uh, The DOD is hierarchical. Uh, We need leadership from the top to set the tone. So the final report recommends the Secretary of Defense establish a steering committee on emerging technology composed of the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Principal Deputy Director for National Intelligence. We we'll call this the Tri Chair Committee, and that committee would be responsible for overseeing the implementation and sustainment of the ecosystem. Now, underneath the Tri Chair, the department's chief information officer should be the executive agent responsible for design and operation of the ecosystem. And then under that, we envision an implementation working group being formed. And this group would be made up of key offices and groups across the department and the intelligence community, including these pathfinders, these bright spots that I started out by mentioning, in order to establish and maintain an open architecture and an evolving reference design to which to build. So that's the first action. Next action, the department needs to expand its networking and communications backbone in order to provide the bandwidth to support transport and data fusion, secure processing, continuous development and fielding of AI applications, and allow the software systems integration for AI to take place at all levels. And the department's efforts to modernize its networking and communications, it should be fully funded and executed as outlined already in the Department of Defense's Digital Modernization Strategy, which came out in 2019. And then the last key action here for for building the technical backbone, this ecosystem within DOD, is for Congress to step forward and prioritize funding for the department. And the commissioners recommend the Armed Services Committees direct the department to promptly develop the digital ecosystem resourcing plan. And this plan would establish and set forth how to sustain and incentivize the ecosystem's use, along with initial seed funding in order to promptly get the ecosystem implementation underway. Well, that was very comprehensive. What about the IC technical environment? So we see it as one ecosystem. It's really more of a artifact of the chapter structure that they're, they're even separate. So everything Mike just said is the vision for these two to work together. I will say that the IC is ahead in a couple of ways, ahead of DOD and really ahead of the rest of the U.S. government. Uh, certainly, the IC was a first mover for cloud computing. The IC's first commercial cloud services, known as C2S contract, went live in 2014, so seven years ago now. And in November of 2020, they awarded the next step to that, which they call the Commercial Cloud Enterprise, or C2E, which is a contract to bring foundational cloud computing services from multiple providers into the intelligence community. 
And along with these efforts, IC has been a leader in establishing security standards for the GovCloud. The IC is ahead in its data modeling and ontologies in many ways. There are ahead in some ways, but we do still think they're not ready to integrate AI-enabled tools throughout the stages of the intelligence process or across all intelligence domains. That's why we make a very similar recommendation that they need to continue to build out what they call the IC information technology environment, they pronounce it iSight, with a focus on the technical foundations that Mike outlined above. Yeah, and just on those technical environment in the ICs, is it the same? I mean, it leans more heavily on data, doesn't it, than it does on the DOD side? It does, yes. And that gets into some of the challenges they have. We can talk about the data in two ways. I would say, first, there's just a pure quantity discussion. And just to give one example, we cited in our report, we pulled from a 2017 posture statement to Congress and the commander of U.S. Central Command testified that his organization had a daily requirement for over 2,800 hours of full motion. So that's just, you know, one combatant command in one part of the world. And if you assume a human analyst could watch 10 hours of video per day, that means it would take 280 intelligence professionals just to watch the raw footage each day uh, before even applying any true analysis or human judgment. So that's part of it. And now, obviously, with the Internet of Things and the proliferation of sensors of all types, that's getting exponentially more problematic. But the second part of that is also the diversity of the information, which can create challenges to sharing and transfer of knowledge. And there's three ways to think about it. The IC has to deal with multi-source, multi-modal, and multi-channel data on a regular basis. For multi-source, you can think about all of the platforms collecting around the world, but both purpose-built and just the Internet of Things producing this. For multimodal, we're talking about things like text or imagery or different types of imagery. And for multi-channel, we're talking about not just you know one single drone, it's 100 drones. So same type, same source, but hundreds of them simultaneously. And if you just think for a real concrete example about a computer vision, like we talked about with Project Maven, that was built originally for full motion video. People may think it'd be easy to transfer those models to, say, synthetic aperture radar, but in fact, it's not because that's a multimodal challenge. The signals are fundamentally different, so the process to train the model will be different. So it it produces multiple compounding issues for the IC. Some of that challenge is labeling data, is that right? Yes, labeling data will always be somewhat of a challenge. I know there are some techniques now to help automate that process, and there's research in the AI community to to try to do more with less labeled data, but I'll pause there and see if Mike wants to add anything to that. Craig, I'd like to pivot to the Department of Defense and, and give you two challenges that we see and would like to highlight from, from their perspective. Maybe this isn't just unique to the Department of Defense, but the two challenges that I'd like to highlight are first, setting up the right conditions to support sharing across the enterprise, this digital enterprise. And then the second is changing the culture to embrace sharing. So the tying theme here is sharing. The policies and processes for providing secured access to the digital ecosystem and its resources, it must change. Security and access must be established at the individual user level in order to facilitate discovery and access and sharing of these AI essential resources, including data. And this shifts security away from what DOD system or network you are on to who you are and your access rights and what is your purpose for seeking access to resources at various levels of sensitivity. So this is a paradigm shift in how to grant uh, secured access, and it needs to be at the individual level. Now, the second challenge would be for groups and individuals within the department to change their mindset and practice. So this is a culture change, which is currently focused more on collecting and holding close stockpiles of data and software rather than sharing these precious resources that would have a force multiplying effect across the enterprise. So to get there, incentives are needed at all levels, including funding, of course, to support the sharing and the overhead of sharing. There needs to be setting new expectations for sharing from above, from leadership. Technically, there needs to be a lowering to the burden for sharing. And then there needs to be mechanisms for rewarding ecosystem contributors and users. 
So these are some of the challenges that we see the department facing in order to embrace this digital ecosystem. And on the challenge of sharing and permissions, of course, that extends to the ICs. But does that extend to allies? Because there is a lot of talk of data sharing among the allies. Yes, there is. And that's a great segue into the final grouping of things that we wanted to bring to you today. And this has to do with who are the stakeholders, right? And what roles do they play within this ecosystem? And Allies and partners, international partners are certainly one of those. But let's start with the need in this ecosystem to host secure development environments to support, firstly, those within the department that I was talking about. So this must include lab researchers, developers within software factories, as well as embedded developers at the tactical edge. And then there's the international partners that you talked about. Our international allies, we should be able to provide secured enclaves within the ecosystem that support these international collaborations and data sharing so that we could be creating interoperable joint force type capabilities that will work when we're engaged in campaigning together. Then there's another group of stakeholders, users, contributors, and that's industry, right? So with industry, there should be other types of collaboration environments created for trusted partners to build AI models on government data, all secured within the ecosystem, and all that data and train models are owned by the government. And then one more group that I'd like to highlight would be the academic community. And this is tied to an instance of the ecosystem that we call the National AI Research Resource, nicknamed the NAIR, which was recommended by the commission in one of our quarterly reports about a year ago. And we're pleased that Congress kicked this off by authorizing a study for implementation in the last National Defense Authorization Act. Now, through the NAIR, academic researchers across the nation would have access to the resources needed to drive AI innovation. And they would give them access to scalable cloud resources, curated data sets, tools, and user support, all as a special node within the ecosystem. And it's that same kind of compartmentalization, collaboration environment that's secured that we envision for allies and international partners as well. Could I leave you with one vignette that paints the picture of one way we want to see this ecosystem be pushed forward. Okay, so imagine, if you will, a small tactical team of soldiers, all right? And they're about to be deployed. So they're preparing. And a member of that team is an AI coder developer, a soldier nonetheless, but has technical savvy with technology. So they take their laptop and attach it to the ecosystem. And based on their access rights and mission orders, they can query and access and provision data for background training and testing, along with algorithms and software workflows that all get loaded into the development environment that's been cloned onto the laptop, and the soldier deploys with the team. In the process, data is harvested in situation during operational maneuvers, and that AI developer, that member of that forward deployed team, he, with his laptop, can train and validate a new AI model on the spot. And let's say it's some new analytic that will be uploaded to the team's surveillance drone. Now, the new app, it's developed, it gets launched and used. And then upon return from the field operations, the soldier comes back and he plugs his laptop back into the ecosystem. And all that surveillance data, the AI models he created, and all the performance data are automatically synced into the ecosystem's repositories for future use. So this would be just one glimpse of what we envision for AI integration in the future. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And integrated for future use by other operators, but also by developers and researchers back in different labs.
And Craig, I had one more point, if I could, that I did not cover on the IC, because I went straight to data when we talk about challenges. And I just think it's worth highlighting that to achieve this vision that we're laying out, our commissioners highlighted the need to change the intelligence community's approach from risk aversion to risk management. And when we looked at it, its current risk management framework does a great job of identifying technical risks when we're talking about onboarding a new technology, which is completely necessary. But the IC also needs a way to to have a mechanism to weigh the costs of not adopting these emerging technologies fast enough. So we make a specific recommendation to stand up a senior risk management council for IT modernization that would be led by the CDO, the CIO, and a new chief technology officer we've recommended that they designate within the IC so that they can help paint that clear risk picture and make better informed recommendations to leadership on when to bring on a new technology, how much technical risk is worth assuming, and really what's the opportunity cost of falling behind and not moving forward. Can we talk a little bit about network computer storage devices? We've talked about data sets and models, how all of this applies across the hardware infrastructure. If you look at our Final report, and in, for example, up front in the introduction, we talk about AI in context. And one way to think about AI is actually a stack of building blocks. And you, you have talent, and you have data, and you have algorithms and applications, and you have integration. But underneath and underpinning all that is this hardware infrastructure that you just asked. And so it's critical. And this is why one of those key actions I mentioned earlier is the DOD needs to build that out. And that includes the storage, that includes the the scalable computing. And you can kind of think of those as traditionally either in the cloud or in data centers. But with AI, this is also being pushed from a hardware perspective all the way out to the edge of the networking, right, to the sensors and the devices. And so that edge computing is part of this hardware infrastructure. Yeah, so it's very relevant. And all of this needs to be part of that integration. And then, of course, part of this, you mentioned training and educating from the general services down to the warfighter on the ground. Is that the same in the IC as it is in the DOD, or is the IC ahead on its education of, of analysts and, and operatives? They face similar challenges. And you know, part of it is certainly education, but also the analysts have to develop the trust in the systems to understand it's giving them the analysis it's giving them, its confidence levels, how it kind of reached those decisions, or they won't trust it enough to use the automated analysis. And that I think is one of the bigger cultural hurdles that everyone is going to struggle with. Because right now, you know, analysts who are trained in a certain way, they have faith and confidence in the system, how they were trained. And when you come in to say, now we're going to insert X piece of automation into whatever part of the intelligence process you put it into, they've got to be able to trust it and understand that what's coming out the other end is valid and useful analysis. And I don't think by any means we're, you know, anybody's past that yet. That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank both mics for their time. I encourage everyone who cares about the future of our world to read the National Security Commission on AI report, which can be found at www.nscai.gov. Regardless of how you feel about military uses of AI, It's critical that people involved in the field understand what the government is doing. The singularity may not be near, but AI is changing your world, so pay attention.